I will tell you as I begin my lesson this morning that my choice of topic is not exactly perhaps the most appropriate for Father's Day, but I think it's an important topic, and I think it's something that may have, maybe has been in your mind recently. I know it's been in my mind because of recent events in the news. On Tuesday, June the 5th, so just a little less than two weeks ago, fashion designer Kate Spade was found dead in her apartment in New York City from an apparent suicide at 55 years old. Some of you ladies may even have some of the handbags that she uh, had produced. Three days later, on June the 8th, celebrity chef Anthony Bourdain was found dead in his hotel room, I believe it was in France, also from an apparent suicide, both of them had hanged themselves. Bourdain was 61 years old. And the news of both of these deaths shocked the world, really. Uh, there are still, even though we are 12, 13 days after their deaths, you still see news stories about these celebrity deaths. Right after Spade's death on June the 5th, so on June the 7th, Time Magazine came out with an article citing various statistics regarding suicide. And it was interesting to see what the statistics revealed about this. I'm going to share with you just a, a couple of them. I don't want to just flood you with statistics. I know that's very confusing. So let me just give you a couple that stood out to me from the article. First, from 1999 to 2016, so for 17 year time period, suicide rates have risen by an average of 28%. The suicide rate for young girls aged 10 to 19 rose by 70% from 2010 to 2016. So in a seven year time span, Girls ages 10 to 19, their suicide rate increased 70%. I don't know all of the factors in that particular statistic, but I will tell you one that I am sure has played some role at least. Social media surely has had something to do with that. And the way that we post pictures of ourselves and the criticisms that come and the way young girls are self-conscious about their bodies and the teenager is such an impressionable person, I, that has to have something to do with that rise in statistic. Regarding that statistic, the article said this, quote, this increase has been substantial enough to narrow the well-established gender gap between the numbers of boys and girls who die by suicide. There has been, for decades, historically, there has been a well-known gender gap in suicide. Girls, by far, attempt suicide more often than boys. But boys, by far, are successful in their attempts more often than girls are. So girls attempt it more, but most of the time they don't follow through with it. Boys, although they attempt it less, when they do, they usually follow through with it. But because of this, uh, that statistic, that gender gap has decreased. Suicide is most common, this is interesting, it's not a statistic, but just an observation. Suicide is most common among middle-aged and older adults. I didn't know that until I read this article. I don't know if this is the explanation for that, but it does seem to correlate with some other statistical research that I have seen in recent times. If you track your entire life, and I'm, I'm speaking very generally here, not, this may not be true for you individually, but, but generally speaking, if you track the happiness levels that people have in their lives, happiness tends to follow a U-shape pattern throughout a person's life. So when you are in your late teens and in your early 20s, your happiness level is very high. 
And then when you get into your late 30s, maybe your early 40s, you get down into the depths of the valley. Your happiness level is about as low as it's going to be in life. And then into your late 40s and 50s, Especially as you get into your 60s and closer to retirement age, your happiness level rises again. And so you have a U-shape. Early in life, you're high. Middle age, you're low. Late in life, you're high once again. Anybody ever heard of a midlife crisis? All right. This is a, a, a part of that discussion. Why does life happiness tend to, again, generally, why does it tend to follow that U-shaped pattern? Well, there's a couple of different explanations, but none of them have really been scientifically uh, proven yet, although the research, I'm sure, is forthcoming. One hypothesis is, well, that's just the way that our work life goes. So when you start off in your early 20s, you've got a new career, maybe you're fresh out of college, and you're excited about the opportunities that may come to you with your job and you're hoping for career advancement. And so you start off really high with excitement. And then you work at the same company for about 10 or 15 years and you start to realize, ah, maybe upper management is not what's in store for me. And you realize you're not going to accomplish those things, work-related things that you wanted. And so then you go down to this valley. But then as you start to get a little bit closer to retirement, the end is near and you're looking forward to that time where you can kick your feet up and relax and take a break and uh, so your happiness rises again. That, that's one hypothesis. The other one doesn't focus so much on work as much as it does just the time of your life. So here you are, you're in your early 20s, you're fresh out of college, you've just met a beautiful young girl, and you're dating and you're happy, and so now you're going to get married. And you do start that new job, and you're excited about opportunities. You've got your whole life ahead of you, and so you're very happy. But then after you've lived life, and you've been in the rat race for a while... You've been married for a while, you've had a few kids come along, and now those kids are teenagers and they're really starting to push your buttons. And so now you go down into the valley because you're like, man, I don't have my whole life ahead of me anymore. So much of my life is behind me and I'm wasting it on these children. And, and, and then, and I'm kidding, children, by the way, sort of. So then... Then you start to come to the realization, though, that as your kids get a little bit older, they become more independent. Now you're starting to send them off to college, and you're going to become an empty nester, and now you can finally go on a date with your spouse, and now you start trending upwards again. So it just kind of follows a life pattern. I don't know which explanation is true, perhaps both, but you do tend to follow this U-shaped pattern in life. Now, is that why people are committing suicide more often in that middle age range because they're in the valley of life in terms of happiness, perhaps. So I realize, again, this is not exactly the most exciting topic to talk about on Father's Day. And if you're visiting with us this morning and you were hoping for a great Father's Day sermon, I am sorry. I don't mean to be depressing. But why did I choose to preach this on Father's Day? Well, number one, as I've already said, it's just been on my mind because it's been in the news. But number two... I never know, and you never know what people might be dealing with. That was one of the things that people said about Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain. If you talk to them, they were happy. Even their friends were shocked, and they said, we have no idea where this came from. What does that tell you? It tells us that even the people we interact with, they may put on a happy face, they may say everything is fine, that they're doing okay, but in reality, they're not doing well at all. And so when you think about this topic, if there is somebody here this morning who may be dealing with some of the things we're going to talk about this morning, the best time to preach on this topic is today. So what should Christians think about suicide? How should we handle this difficult subject? Well, like with most things, there's a short answer, and then there's a longer, more involved answer. Sometimes we just give the short answer, and we say, end of discussion. But you know that with most things, that's not always the most helpful way to answer a question. In short, though, the answer is this. The Bible, in many places, 
so many places that I'm just going to take it for granted that you believe this and I don't need to prove this to you. But the Bible says in numerous places that murder and taking the life of another is sinful. Therefore, self-murder would also be sinful. Now that's the short answer. But I'm going to give you some qualifiers this morning as we try to think through this a little bit. Let us never, though, be calloused about this subject. If we're giving somebody that short answer, let's, let's not just uh, speak in a very harsh way about this because this is not an easy subject to talk about with people, particularly people whose lives have been affected by this in some way. I don't know. There may be some here this morning whose lives have been affected by this in some way. This is not an always simple subject. These kinds of subjects never are simple. But I want to suggest to you this morning that there are some underlying and fundamental things here that I think we need to consider because I think these things are very important. So let's talk first of all this morning about a couple of foundation issues that I think are important as we as Christians give our thoughts and, and give our answers on this subject. The first foundational point is this. Human life is precious and it is valuable. Every human life is precious and valuable. And it begins, the Bible begins to teach us that right from page one. The scripture reading that we had this morning from Genesis chapter one and verse 26, where God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And in verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created us in his image. We talked about that before and some of the things that that involves, and so I don't want to go through all of that again. But it is only human beings that this is true of. Animals were not made in the image of God. Plants and rocks were not made in the image of God. It is only humans. There's something special about human life. The problem, though, as you read through the early pages of Genesis, is that not always did humans recognize that. And so Cain was the first person to take the life of another human. He didn't appreciate this, this point that human life is precious and valuable. And then when you come to Genesis chapter 6, the scripture says that in the days of Noah, God looked upon the earth and he looked at all of the actions of men and even the thoughts of men. And he saw that their hearts were intent on doing evil. So men are killing one another and stealing from one another and, and all of this sin is rampant and, and it gets so bad that God says, I've had enough and I am going to purge the earth of this evil and this wickedness because men do not respect men anymore. And so in Genesis chapter 6 and 7 and 8, we have the story of the flood waters and how God brings about that purging. But then in Genesis chapter 9, if you'll look at these scriptures with me, after the flood waters recede and Noah and his family come off of the ark and they worship God, God speaks to Noah in chapter 9 and he says in verse 5, Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. If you take someone else's life, someone else will take your life. Someone else may take your life because you are not to murder. You are not to take the life of other people. Why? Because in the image of God, men were created. Human life is valuable and it is precious. Murder is therefore wrong because we are taking from someone else that which is not ours to take. We were not the ones who gave life to that person, despite the fact that we sometimes use that to threaten our children. I brought you into this world and I'll take you out. You know, we were really not the ones who gave life to our children. Yes, we were the, one who, uh, the ones who in the relationship with our spouse physically brought them about, but God gave life to our children. He is the only one who can give life. It is not to us to take it away. 
God is the giver of life because he is the one to whom life belongs. And therefore, he has the right and only he has the right to decide when someone's life should be taken away from them. We believe, the Bible teaches, God places infinite value on human life. How much does God value humanity? He gave up his own life for humanity. That's how much God values humanity. Jesus Christ surrendered his life for the sake of all of us that we might have life. That is how much he loves us and he values us. And folks, this is why, this is a separate issue, but this is why we plead the cause of the unborn. This is why we fight against the evil of abortion because we say that is a human life inside that woman's body and that life has infinite worth and value. And so if we believe that God values human life and that murder or the taking of human life is sinful, then when it comes to suicide, we have to apply those principles to ourselves. If human life is precious and valuable, we can't make an exception for our own lives and say, well, that's not true for me. And so if I took my life, what's it going to matter? It doesn't mean anything. That's not true because every life is precious. And so this is an important fundamental key for us. If God values all human life, then that includes my life. And therefore, I should not take my own life. But here's the second foundational principle that I think is helpful in this discussion, and that is that we are to live our lives for the glory and the honor of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, the apostle Paul said that you, Christian, have been bought with a price. Your body is not your own. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you. And so our bodies do not belong to us. They belong to God. And the life, as we've said already, that he put within us belongs to him. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse 31, it says, Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And so we, and there are other texts that we could look at to uh, appeal to, uh, uh, to support this point, but we are to live our lives as humans created in God's image, but especially as Christians who identify with Jesus Christ, we are to live in such a way that brings honor and glory to Jesus Christ. God seeks to use our lives for his purposes, purposes that perhaps we're not even aware of. God can work through us to accomplish his will but when we end our lives, he can no longer use us. He, he can no longer use us for his glory and use us to accomplish his will because there's no turning back when we take our own lives. I think these are two very important principles when we are having discussions with people about this topic. We need to remember these two things. So as we think about these two things then, where we have to ask the question, why is it that people commit suicide? Do people just not see the precious value of their life? Perhaps not. But why do people commit suicide? Well, there are many reasons. And, and I suspect that in the cases of people who do take their lives, there's not just one reason. There's probably... A, a, a number of reasons why they have come to this point in their lives. If you look in the scriptures, you'll see some reasons why people commit suicide. But before I get into some of those, let me make this observation. When you read through your Bible and you look for examples of suicide, you'll only find about five or seven. It depends on how you count them. Uh, is one really a suicide or not? And I'll give you an example. Remember the story of Samson. When he pulled the pillars down and the, the building collapsed on all of the Philistines and Samson. Some people consider that a suicide. I'm inclined to not think of that really as a suicide. But depending on how you count some of these nuanced stories, you'll come up with somewhere between five, six, or seven 
cases. Not all that much. So what are the reasons that those individuals have taken their lives? Well, let me share with you three of them that I, I feel confident from Scripture are, uh, are cases of suicide or attempted suicide. And let's give the reasons for those. What's the most obvious case of suicide in the scriptures? Well, of course, that's Judas. After Judas uh, betrayed Jesus. In Matthew chapter 27, turn there with me if you would. Matthew 27, Judas has conspired with the Jewish leaders who want Jesus dead. And he has agreed to, to hand Jesus over to them for a sum of money. It is my belief about this, this, uh, this situation. You may disagree with this, and that's okay. It's my belief, though, that Judas never intended things to go as far as they did. I really believe in the mind of Judas, he thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surrender Jesus over to the leaders. I'm going to make a little money to put in my pocket. And, you know, Jesus is obviously innocent. There's no way they're going to be able to find him guilty on anything. And so I'm going to be able to make a little bit of money, and Jesus is going to get set free. Look at Matthew 27 and verse 3. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, perhaps he didn't expect that. I didn't actually think they were going to convict him of anything. I didn't think they would. So when he saw that Jesus had been condemned, he felt remorse. And he returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed and he went away and he hanged himself. And so Judas commits suicide because of this excessive remorse and this heavy guilt that he is feeling. And there are people who have taken their lives for that reason. They have done something or they have done some series of things that have just brought this immense guilt and remorse into their lives. In the Bible, we also see that defeat and rejection bring suicide. In 1 Kings chapter 16, 1 Kings chapter 16, there was a king in Israel whose name was Zimri or Zimri. 1 Kings chapter 16, if you look at verse 8. Excuse me, that is not the right reference. I believe that I uh, wrote down the wrong... Yep, I sure did. Okay, well, somebody can work, uh, correct me on that. I apologize, but here's what happened. Zimri, the king, he sees the armies of his enemy gathering around and he gets really nervous. He knows that he's been defeated. And so he goes into his chamber and uh, the, the, the walls of the, the roof that fall down on top of him and he, and he dies. He somehow made, made all that happen. Um, and he, he committed suicide in that way. And the fact that I can't remember the reference is really frustrating me and I'm sorry about that. So don't write down what's on the screen. That's not the right, that is not the right text. I apologize. But Zimri takes his life because he knows that he's been defeated by his enemies. Here's another example. This one, uh, I believe, is right. 2 Samuel chapter 17. 2 Samuel 17. 2 Samuel chapter 17. There's a story of a man named Ahithophel. Ahithophel. It's a great name uh, for your sons if you're expecting boys. Um, not really, though, because he's not a good character in this story. Ahithophel had given some advice to David's son, Absalom. And Absalom thought about what Ahithophel said. He liked the idea at first, but he wanted to get counsel from somebody else. He got some different advice, and he decided to go with the other man's advice, not Ahithophel's. And in 2 Samuel 17 and in verse 23... In 2 Samuel 17 and verse 23, when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and arose and went to his house, to his city, and he set his house in order and strangled himself. Thus he died and was buried in the grave of his father. Ahithophel is an advisor to Absalom, and if his advice is proven to be poor advice, he's probably going to be demoted. 
And so he knows that his advice has not been sought or at least not been followed. And so now he thinks, my professional career is over. I've got nothing else to live for. And he goes and he commits suicide. Acts chapter 16 and verse 27. Here is an example of an attempted suicide. But I include it here. If it were not for Paul and Silas, it would have been a suicide. Acts chapter 16, in the city of Philippi, Paul and Silas are in prison and they are under the watch and the care of a jailer who is to watch over the prison and make sure that none of the prisoners escape. And in Acts chapter 16, there is this earthquake, this miraculous earthquake, and all of the prisoners' shackles and bonds are broken loose. And the jailer, once he kind of comes to, he realizes that all of their shackles have been broken, and he takes out his sword, and he's about to kill himself because he knows if all these prisoners get out, I'm the one who is held responsible. Now, Paul and Silas say to him, do yourself no harm. All the prisoners are here. Don't hurt yourself. But here is a man who through his feeling of failure, he was about to take his own life. Now, when we think about other reasons as to why people commit suicide, we move away from the scripture uh, and the examples therein, we think about people that we know of today who have taken their own lives. They do it for different reasons. They do it for depression, severe loss, tragedy, loneliness, addictions that are of a very serious nature. Uh, there are all kinds of reasons as to why people take their own lives. But people who do it have usually sunken to a very low place in life because of these and maybe other factors. Emotionally, mentally, they are in very dark places that unless you've been there yourself or if you have seen it firsthand, it is very difficult to understand where these people are. Now, Christians, as I said before, have, have generally agreed that suicide is wrong and sinful, and, and I agree with that. However, we are not the judges of others' actions, and I think we need to give consideration to a person's mental state when they make a decision like this. Let me give you an example of something that happened to me a few years ago. There was a sister in Christ who came to me, and, and she asked me, she said, I want to know if my father is in hell because he took his own life in his older years. She went on to explain. He had multiple health problems as he was aging, and because of all of his health problems, he was on multiple medications. And those medications, the doctors confirmed, drove him out of his mind. And while he was in this mental state of madness, he took his life. Is my dad lost? <laughs> I told her, I'm not the judge of your dad. But I also told her this. If there is such a concept as the age of accountability, we talk about that. The age of accountability. The age at which an individual becomes accountable before God. We understand that we're not really talking about an age so much as we are talking about a, a level of maturity, a level of mental capability to understand right and wrong, to understand that there is a God who has given us a word about how we are to live and, and I am accountable to that God and to, to that word. That's really what we're talking about. We can't just put an age on it and say, well, you know, 12 is the number or 25 is the number. It's all about the mental state of the person, the maturity of the person. So if that's true, that there must be a mental capacity and a mental maturity for a person to become accountable before God, then how does that apply to the person who in a moment of mental madness takes his or her own life? Now, I don't know the answers to that. I'm just posing that as something for us to think about. But as a balance to that, I can also imagine a situation where a person's mental state in life has deteriorated, perhaps even to the point of, uh, of mental insanity. And that has happened because of a long 
series of choices, evil choices, that that person has made that took them to that mental state. I think I might look at that a little bit differently. But here's what I'm saying to you. We're not the judge. Only God can do that. And he knows how all of these nuanced situations and these really difficult situations are going to be settled. So perhaps rather than trying to be the judges of other people's eternal destiny, why don't we seek rather to find ways to help them before they have to figure out what their eternal destiny is going to be. And so let's just for a few moments, very quickly, as we end our lesson this morning, talk about the defense against suicide. I think there are both positive and negative defenses against suicide. If you're thinking about suicide, here are some things that you need to consider. First of all, let's consider the negative things. Two things. Number one, as we've already seen, it violates principles of Scripture regarding life and the value of human life. You are precious to God, and you don't want to do anything that would take away this understanding of what God thinks about your life. You don't want to do anything, moreover, that would jeopardize your eternal destiny because you didn't agree with or you didn't see the value of your life. Here's the second thing. If you take your life, you will leave your family in emotional turmoil for the rest of their lives. You are dealing with immense sorrow and guilt, there's no question, but if you take your life, you're going to pass that on to your loved ones, and now they will be dealing with immense sorrow and guilt, because here's what happens. People take their own life, and then the family members start to say, what did I do that drove them to this? Or, what could I have done differently that might have helped bring her out of this? Or what, what did we do as a family that pushed them away? How did we get to this point? And the fact is that many times the ones who are left behind are completely innocent in the matter. They didn't do anything wrong to push people away. They didn't do anything wrong to hurt, to hurt that relationship. But they're going to believe that they did. Because if you truly were happy and if you truly were satisfied with your life as you appeared to be, you would not have done this. And so they immediately feel guilty themselves. What are some positive things that I think we can consider? Three things, very quickly. Number one, as a Christian, you are an heir to all of God's promises. And you don't want to do anything that would endanger that. You don't want this poor and sinful decision, I believe, as we've seen from Scripture, you don't want to, that to be the last decision that you carry with you into eternity. You are an heir of, to all of God's promises. Don't endanger that. Secondly, God can use your trials and your adverse circumstances to improve your faith and character. There are so many biblical characters who got to a very low point in life, and they desired death even. You, you think about Elijah in 1 Kings 19. He, he said, take my life, Lord. It would be better if I was dead than to have Jezebel chasing after me and hating me. Take my life. Well, aren't we glad God didn't take Elijah's life? <laughs> Aren't we glad that Elijah learned uh, that this was a trial for him and that on the other side that he was going to become stronger and continue doing great things for the Lord? Jeremiah did this. Jeremiah, he went out preaching and he was even told, you're going to go out and preach to people, but they're not going to listen to you. And not only are they not going to listen to you, they're going to try to kill you. And a couple of times in the book of Jeremiah, you see him lamenting his own life, wishing that he was not living. And so you see cases of people who desire death, but they didn't actually carry it out. They didn't actually take their own lives. And on the other side of their trials, they became stronger and they became of more useful service to the Lord, which leads us to the third and the final thing. Perhaps this trial will bring greater influence for the Lord through you. I mentioned early in the lesson that sometimes God has purposes that we don't know about. 
And it could be that once we get through this difficult time in life, once we work through this and we become stronger, we may go on to influence other people for the cause of Christ. And we can say, Jesus brought me through a terrible time in my life. Can I talk to you about what he could do for you? We could share our stories with people and talk about our sorrow and our difficulty and that may influence people for the Lord. But if we take our lives, that's the end of it. So let me plead with you this morning as we end our lesson. If you, if you today or if you ever feel like your life has sunk to such a low point that the only resort that you have is to take your life, please don't follow through with it. It may not seem like it at the time, but you have so much to live for. You have so many people who love you and care about you, and you may not feel that at the time, but you do. They're there, and, and they may not even recognize you're struggling and you're suffering, and it could be that they don't recognize it because you haven't opened up, you haven't been vulnerable, and you haven't shared some of your difficulties, w would you make a deal with me? Would you agree to be more open and more vulnerable if maybe I would agree to try to be more perceptive and maybe see if I could see some things in your heart? Don't take your own life. Seek help either from your peers or from professionals if that's what we need to do. You are precious. You are valuable. And let's make sure that we never forget that. Well, now that we're all sufficiently depressed, we're going to try to sing a song of invitation and encourage people to come to know Jesus Christ. Zion's call sweetly rings, and it's a wonderful call. It is a call of love, a call of mercy and grace from heaven that comes down to us through the person of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us on the cross. And it is a call that didn't just ring 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, but it is a call that still rings loud and clear today. Would you listen to it if you're not a Christian? Or if you are a Christian, but you've gone back into the world, the call is still there for you. Answer, come to the Lord. Make your life right. If we can help you this morning, please come as we stand and sing.